So if you like classic Monopoly, you're going to love this. It's Monopoly on your phone. Now, who want to watch something scary? Of course you do, that's why you're here. And because you're a suspense and horror fan like me, I have a very special offer for you from Shudder. Shudder is the Netflix for horror. It has a unique collection of exclusive and original films and series, horror classics, and blockbuster hits. New thrillers are added every single week. A classic collection you'd love. You can stream the best horror Go to Shudder.com and use the promo code SS. If you didn't hear, we just launched a VIP. If you're like me and love scary stories, I'm sure there have been nights when you didn't sleep that well. Whether it's nightmares or an uncomfortable mattress that's keeping me up, my day is nowhere near as productive as when I get a blissful night's rest. So if you're struggling to get a good night's sleep, unfortunately I can't do anything about your nightmares, but I can recommend that you try a purple mattress comes backed by a 10-year warranty and is shipped to your home for free. That's in addition to the great free text SS to 474747. That's SS to 474747. Message and data rates may apply. Hey, I'm Sapphire. Wanna hear something scary? My lucky boy. The following is based on a story submitted by Jason, told from the point of view of his mother. I always thought my son Jason was lucky. You know, he actually wasn't breathing when I gave birth to him, but after being what the doctor claimed legally dead for almost five minutes, he made a miraculous recovery. And ever since then, he's narrowly escaped death countless times. When he was still pretty little, he would choke on his food fairly easily, so I'd always have to watch him closely. There were times when he'd slip out from his high chair, despite being securely strapped in. And all those times, I was right there to break his fall. I used to joke that Jason had a death wish. I began to really worry about him when he turned about five. One night, he came running into my room, crying hysterically. The lady is trying to get me. Oh, JC, it's okay. You were probably just having a bad dream, that's all. And it went on like this for the rest of the week. He refused to sleep alone in his room. Eventually, he also became afraid during the day. I would catch him muttering to himself. Please go away. Who are you talking to, JC? The lady, she won't leave me alone. Having nightmares was pretty common for a kid his age, and so was having imaginary friends. But I was starting to really worry about his mental health. He was losing sleep, he wouldn't eat. I could just feel him slowly falling apart. So I took him to a child psychiatrist. I watched from afar as Jason told the doctor about the woman who was tormenting him day and night. The doctor handed him some crayons and paper and told him to draw what the woman looked like. When Jason was done, he handed the paper to the doctor, who was visibly startled. He gestured for me to come outside the room with him to talk. I think there's a chance your child might be suffering from schizophrenia, he said. My heart dropped. I'd like to do some more tests with him if that's all right with you. So you think everything he's been talking about is just a hallucination? The doctor handed me the paper with Jason's drawing. I too was startled. My son had drawn what appeared to be a tall, thin woman with no eyes and blood dripping down from the top of her head. Her lips were completely torn off, exposing her rotting and chipped teeth. If this is who he saw every day, no wonder he was so horrified. Later that day, I called my sister. We didn't live in the same state, but we were really close and always kept in touch with each other. I was updating her on Jason, about his freaky drawing, and what the doctor said. My sister was quiet for a moment. Sis, I know you don't really believe in this stuff. My sister said very carefully. But how open are you to finding a more non-medical evaluation? 
What the hell did that mean? She then proceeded to give me the phone number of a woman named Lana and told me to set an appointment with her as soon as possible. So that weekend, I brought Jason with me to see my sister's psychic. She was right. I didn't really believe in this sort of thing, but my sister offered to pay for the appointment, so I figured it wouldn't hurt just to see what this woman had to say. I was determined to get my son the help he needed. When we arrived at Lana's house, she greeted us at the door. She looked like she was in her 30s. Her suit was perfectly tailored to her body. Her black hair was flawlessly pulled back in a bun. She welcomed us into her home with a warm smile. I've never been to a psychic's house before, but Lana's place didn't look at all like what I was expecting it to look like. It was kind of normal. Very chic, actually. No crystal balls or animal parts in jars. Just clean, modern decor. She motioned for us to join her in the spotless living room. You have a very lovely home, I blurted out. Oh, thank you so much. There's just so much noise in my head that it helps to have a living space that doesn't add to the chaos. Lana looked into Jason's eyes. And you must be Jason. She continued to stare deeply and curiously into his eyes. And the longer she stared, the more faded her smile became. Have you ever had a near-death experience, Jason? He shook his head, but I interjected. Funny you ask that, he's actually had several from the moment he was born. What can I say? He's a lucky boy. But Lana's face made it clear that she did not agree with that statement. I usually try to break information delicately for my clients, but I think I need to be frank with you. When Jason died that first time, his soul was in another dimension. And while he was there, a woman found him and decided that she wanted him to be her son. Then when Jason was resuscitated, she was left alone. And she's been trying to reunite with him ever since. This was not in any way what I had expected to hear. My sister had once told me the theory that when people have a near-death experience, they gain contact with the spirit world. But I didn't think that was true. Okay, so how do we get rid of her? How do we stop her from terrorizing my son? Lana shrugged. You already know what she wants. We left shortly after that. I texted my sister that she wasted her money on a fraud. I decided that we were going to continue the evaluation with the child psychiatrist and go about this the right way. Later that night, Jason asked to sleep in the bed with me, like usual. But in the middle of the night, I woke up to a tapping on my shoulder. Jason was standing by the bed, looking down on me. His face was incredibly calm. JC, is everything okay? I just wanted to say goodbye, Mommy. Goodbye? Where are you going? With new Mommy. He gestured behind him, and for the first time, I saw her. The woman in his drawing. Don't worry, Mommy. I'm not scared anymore. The woman held out her hand, and Jason walked over to her. I lunged out of bed and tried to grab him, but just as I reached him, he was gone. Just like that. I was a wreck. But after the reality of what had just happened sank in, I oddly felt relieved to know that he was no longer scared or suffering. I just wish, I just wish I could have saved him just one more time. Thank you to all of our patrons. Hope they won't shoot me down soon. Stitch Fix is an online person. Um, slash stitchfix.com. Randall. This chapter is inspired by a true story from Elsie Bannon. I work in a hospital. I won't say which for obvious privacy reasons. The hospital is old, very old. 
It was built in the early 1800s, first serving as a post office, then abandoned for a while before it was turned into a hospital for veterans in the 1920s. Despite having worked there for about five months, I felt like the rest of the staff was always sort of cold to me. Whenever I'd try to strike up some small talk, they'd smile and walk away. But not everyone is like that. There's another nurse, Cassandra, who I get along with really well. Don't worry about them, they're just cranky from the night shifts, she'd say. Cassandra is really into ghost stories. I'm a Christian, so I didn't believe in any of her tales, but I'd like to listen to them. She was a really good storyteller. She told me about some unbelievable stuff that happened to her as a kid. Yeah, I see spirits all the time. I've sort of gotten used to it. All the time, huh? So even right now? I asked, jokingly. Cassandra paused, then chuckled. She never answered my question. A couple weeks ago, Cassandra and I were working the day shift. Visiting hours had just ended, and I was making my usual rounds, checking on all the patients. I heard muttering behind me. I turned to see some of the staff looking at me, strangely. Seriously, what is their problem with me? I thought to myself. But I ignored them, like I always do. About an hour later, I was notified that a patient had died. I was tasked with delivering the body down to the morgue in the basement. It would be my first time going down there. Cassandra had once told me that the basement was the oldest part of the building, the only part that was never renovated. Be careful down there, she said. I thought she was just trying to scare me. But I had nothing to be afraid of. A police officer would always escort nurses and bodies down to the basement to ensure that the body wasn't disturbed in any way. So the policeman, the dead body, and I stepped into the elevator from the sixth floor. I pressed the button for the basement and we began to descend. We stopped momentarily and began to move again. But when the doors opened, we found ourselves back on the sixth floor. I pressed the button for the basement again and the exact same thing happened as if the elevator didn't want us to go down there. Are you trying to play a prank? He said, accusingly. After countless tries, the elevator continued to act up. So we had no choice but to take the ramp all the way down. Once we reached the basement level, it was very clear how untouched this floor was. The original brick walls remained, with pipes jutting out every few feet. The hanging lights were dirty and flickering. It was definitely cold and creepy down there but that's just because it was old. We dropped the body off at the morgue and began to walk back up the ramp. I was a few paces ahead of the policeman. Suddenly, I heard him say, Elsie. I stopped and turned to look at him. He just stared at me. What? Didn't you just say my name? I didn't say anything. Oh, maybe it was the pipes or something. We continued walking and I heard my name again. Elsie! Just as I turned around, the policeman screamed in pain as he fell face first onto the floor. I rushed over to him to help him up. Something in the corner of my eye moved and I looked up just in time to see a dark shadowy mass disappear into the wall. I looked at the policeman. He had definitely seen it too. We ran. We ran up to the first floor without stopping. I noticed the policeman was holding the back of his neck in pain, so I asked him if I could take a look. And what I saw, I was so confused. There was a deep, dark bruise forming. He said it felt like somebody punched him really hard in the neck. But I was there. Nothing could have possibly hit him. He went home after that. I walked back up to the sixth floor and Cassandra came up to me. I think she could tell that something was wrong. What happened down there? I couldn't speak. I was still trying to make sense of what just happened. Oh my God, did Randall do something? Randall, who's Randall? Cassandra paused and took a breath. There's something I need to tell you. Ever since you started working here, uh, see, there's this uh, guy um, and, well, he really seems to like you. You mean someone who works here? What does this have to do with no, anything? No, uh, he's not alive. I think he's a veteran. Well, was. But uh, he's not around you all the time, but he follows you around here a lot. So much so that the rest of the staff is scared to come near you. 
Like he's always putting his arm around you. What? He just seems really protective of you. I think he might have been jealous that you were alone with that policeman down there. I just stared at her. Cass, you know I love your ghost stories, but I don't find this funny. Her expression remained the same. I'm sorry. I never wanted to say anything because I figured he was harmless. But it seems like he's got it bad. <sighs> if you're like me and love scary stories, I'm sure there have been nights when you didn't sleep that well. Whether it's nightmares or an uncomfortable mattress that's keeping me up, my day is nowhere near as productive as when I get a blissful night's rest. So if you're struggling to get a good night's sleep, unfortunately I can't do anything about your nightmares, but I can This is Go Henry. It's a card and an app. It teaches kids how money works safely. They customize their cards engaged and we're off to the races, competing with each other to see who could find the best venue for the best price. But there was one point of tension in the relationship. Daniel was incredibly jealous of Melinda's best friend from childhood, Angelica. He was convinced that this so-called friend was in love with his bride-to-be and she would try and sabotage the wedding by any means possible. Melinda always had to reassure him that he was overthinking things and that there was nothing to worry about. You have no reason to feel this way. Angelica is my oldest friend. Just tell me this, Daniel asked. Did you ever have feelings for her? Melinda paused. Yes, I have. But it was years ago, please, you have to understand. Daniel wasn't happy with this answer. You have to uninvite her. Are you crazy? She's in my bridal party. I can't uninvite her. I honestly don't know if I can handle seeing her there. It's our wedding day. It's supposed to be perfect. The couple stared at each other, both silently challenging the other to give in first. Melinda sighed. If that's what will make you happy, I'll talk to her. Months later, the day of the wedding arrived. The engaged couple had forgotten about their past arguments and were just happy that the day had come. Melinda ended up finding the best venue for the best price, her parents' large and lavish Victorian mansion. The ceremony was going to be held outside in the gorgeous gardens and the reception would take place inside. The guests were filing in and finding their seats while Melinda was hiding from sight near the end of the aisle. Suddenly, Daniel appeared next to her. Danny, you're not supposed to see me. She's here. Why is she here? You told me she wasn't going to come. Oh my God, she's sitting in the back. She's not in the bridal party anymore. You literally don't have to see or speak to her. Well, I did see her, and I just can't believe you'd do this to me. Really? You're gonna do this right now? At this point, the couple's voices were rising, causing the guests to turn and look over at them. Hey. You know what will be fun? Why don't we play a game of hide and seek with all the guests? That always cheers you up. And afterwards, I can talk to Angelica again. Deal? Daniel exhaled. I'm so sorry. I know I'm being ridiculous. I know that. I know she's important to you, and it's not fair of me to act this way. I love you. I love you too. Now let's play. I'll be it. The guests are all informed of the game of hide and seek before the ceremony, and they willingly participate. Melinda closed her eyes and began counting backwards from 30, and everyone scattered to find a hiding spot. The property was huge, so there was plenty of space. Ready or not, here I come! Melinda grew up in this house and knew every nook and cranny, so she had no problem finding everyone. Except for one person, the groom. So all the other guests began to help Melinda look for him. Melinda heard some people whispering that they thought Daniel might have gotten cold feet and ran away. After they searched the entire property, Melinda collapsed to the floor in tears. Angelica approached her. I know this isn't what you want to hear, but I think I saw Daniel running out the gates during the game. I mean, he could be coming back, but I don't know. I'm so sorry, Mel. The wedding was clearly no longer happening, so the guests returned to their cars and headed home, while Angelica continued to comfort the bride. 
You're my best friend and I will always be here for you. Remember, she held out her pinky finger. Together forever, the bride smiled, wiped the tears from her eyes and hooked her pinky onto Angelica's and said, no matter whatever. Years went by. Angelica and Melinda became closer than ever. Memories of old crushes resulted in casual dates, which led to a surprisingly fast engagement. The wedding venue? Melinda's parents' Victorian mansion. Melinda's parents felt a little strange that their daughter would want to plan a wedding at their home again, but they just wanted her to be happy. So Angelica, Melinda, and her parents began to clean out the manor. Melinda went upstairs to see if she could find some tablecloths and decor to use for the wedding. That's when she noticed a door. It wasn't there when she was a kid. Mom, was this door always here? Melinda shouted down the stairs to her mom, who replied, Oh, we added that room a couple years ago for extra storage. Melinda opened it to find a very messy and dusty room filled with boxes and furniture. In the middle of the room was a large antique trunk. There was a lock with the key still inside. Curious, she turned it and hoisted the heavy lid with both hands. Immediately, a putrid stench seeped out through the open crack. As new air flew in, old air came out. She dropped the lid on the side and covered her nose. She peered inside and her eyes went wide. The rotting corpse of a man, face stretched in anguish, lay battered and broken within the trunk. There were scratch marks highlighted with dried blood on the inside of the lid. The man's skin was leathery and stiff, just like the suit that hung across his gray flesh, the dusty and rumpled suit of Daniel. Melinda heard footsteps behind her. She turned around to find Angelica in the doorway. Angie, you said you saw him leave the property. You, you knew he was in here, didn't you? Angelica continued to stare, face devoid of all emotion. Angie, did you do this? We made a promise, Mel, and I wasn't going to let anyone get in between us. Don't you remember? She held out her pinky. Together forever, no matter whatever. In the Phra Nong district of Thailand in the mid 1800s, there lived a woman called Mai Na, who was deeply in love with her husband, Tin Ma. When Mai Na was eight months pregnant, Tin Ma was drafted to fight in the war. He was heartbroken to know he wouldn't be there for the birth of their child. What if something happens to me? I can't stand the thought of leaving you and our baby alone. Don't worry, my love. You will return home safely, and we will both be here to greet you when you do. And so, Team Ma left, feeling hopeful, but still understandably terrified. A few months later, he was able to return home, excited to see his wife and to meet his child. But when he arrived at his village, his neighbor Kiet approached him. You need to leave. Excuse me? Please get out of my way. I need to see my family. You should not go in that house. You don't want to know the terrible things that have happened while you were away. Your wife, she's not who you think she is. It's better for both of you if you leave. You don't want to be with her anymore. Hard water, it attacks your skin. And you don't want to be with her anymore. Tinma was incredibly offended. How dare you imply that my wife was not faithful to me while I was away? Now please move. Tidma, being much bigger and stronger than Kiet, shoved past him with ease. He knew his wife. He knew that she would never do anything to hurt their relationship. Carefully, he opened the door. There was Mina, cradling their healthy baby. They exchanged a deep hug and began to catch up. Can you believe that Kiet tried to make me think that you had been unfaithful while I was gone? Pathetic, isn't it? Yes, very. What a silly old man. For the next few weeks, everything was perfect. Between Tidma and Mina, at least. 
Whenever Teen Ma went into the village, he could feel the stares and hear the whispers of his neighbors. Do you think he knows? I can't believe he's still happened? living with her. It's oh, just so sad. Kiet is probably spreading rumors, he thought to himself. He decided to confront him about it. So he went to his house and knocked on the door. No answer. He knocked again, but it was clear he wasn't there. So he went back home. Mai Na was in the kitchen making lunch. Have you seen Kiet lately? Teen Ma asked. No, why do you ask, my love? I thought he might be spreading rumors about you and I wanted to tell him to stop. Oh, don't worry about him, dear. I already spoke with him. He won't be bothering us again. Mai Na continued to prepare lunch while her husband waited patiently in the dining room. He watched lovingly from afar, just happy to be in his home with his family. Mai Na dropped a lime on the ground and it fell between the gap in the floorboards. Tima watched as Mai Na bent down and reached right through the floorboards to pick it up. He couldn't believe his eyes. D did he just see what he thought he saw? He looked over at his baby daughter. Suddenly everything felt very wrong. Mai Na looked up and saw her husband staring in disbelief at her. Is something wrong, my love? She's not who you think she is. What did you do to Kit? You seem upset, my dear. Come here. He had to get out of that house. And so he ran. But he could hear his wife's voice yelling in anger. You promised to always love me. Come back. He turned his head to see that the woman he once loved had grown into a massive, angry spirit, wreaking havoc on the village. Tima made it to the nearby temple and quickly told one of the monks to help him stop his wife. This monk was extremely powerful, and when Mayna reached the temple, he was able to capture and trap her spirit into a jar. And that jar was kept in the royal family, passed down from heir to heir, to ensure that Mayna was never released. Today, you can visit this temple in Thailand where a shrine to Mayna is kept. Visitors from around the world offer gifts and flowers in order to keep her spirit at ease. For who knows what will happen if she ever gets out again. Want more Something Scary? You can hear more stories over on the Something Scary podcast.